sessions also <clears throat> in other courses. And uh, we request His Holiness to kindly bless all of us and give His cosmos mercy and with this wonderful enlightenment. So we welcome His Holiness by three times chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Maharaj, we are very, very happy to have you here today with us. And uh, <clears throat> we are very confident and sure that you would shower your kind mercy upon all of us. All the students are also very eager to hear from you and to take your causeless blessings. So thank you very much, Maharaj, for giving yourself for this request and blessing all of us. So kind of you, Maharaj. Thank you. Please take over. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu, for your kind words. I'll, I'll try my best. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present some Krishna conscious philosophy. Okay. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pricharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, want to share the screen? I have a PowerPoint want to use this morning. So, am I a co-host or how do I do yes, it? You are a co-host, you can share it. Okay. Are you able to see it? Not yet, Maharaj. Oh my God. Wait, then. And I have to do something. We, we, we just now saw your screen. We just now saw your screen. What? It was... Uh, Maharaj, yeah. we saw your screen with uh, with all the different files that was listed, but mm -hmm. not the specific PPT. Uh -huh. So probably you need to open the PPT first and then afterwards you can share. I need to open the PPT first, yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So what do I do? Close this? I'll close down my connection and come back into Zoom after I open the... Let me do that.
Recording in progress. Okay, let's see now. Okay. Now do you yes, see? Yes, we can see. Okay. All right. All right, we're going to begin here with a little quote from the song of Lord Shiva, just to bring us into the spiritual dimension. My dear Lord, your two lotus feet are so beautiful that they appear like two blossoming petals of the lotus flower which grows during the autumn season. Indeed, the nails of your lotus feet emanate such a great effulgence that they immediately dissipate all the darkness in the heart of a conditioned soul. My dear Lord, kindly show me that form of yours which always dissipates all kinds of darkness in the heart of a devotee. My dear Lord, you are the supreme spiritual master of everyone. Therefore, all conditioned souls covered with the darkness of ignorance can be enlightened by you as the spiritual master. That's Srimad Bhagavatam, fourth canto. All right. You finished the first canto. When did, did you just finish it? Just a few days ago? Yes, well, last week. Okay. So everyone's serious about understanding the transcendental science and seeing the transcendental form of the Lord must first of all attempt to see the lotus feet of the Lord by studying <clears throat> the first and second cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. When one sees the lotus feet of the Lord, all kinds of doubts and fears within his heart are vanquished. So there you can see the Lord's lotus feet with the wonderful markings. Just to overview what happened in the, in the first canto very quickly, it began with Sutta Goswami and the sages in Naimasharanya. Now Sutta Goswami actually he's only speaking in the first canto and then we'll meet him again in the twelfth canto where he will speak for five chapters. But the first canto, first canto is the sage, first chapter was the sages inquiring to Sutta Goswami. And then Sutta Goswami began replying to the sages' inquiries, and you had descriptions of the Lord's incarnations. And then that went on into Narada Muni, and they wanted, they wanted to hear about the history, where how the Srimad Bhagavatam came to be spoken. So it was described how Srila Vyasadeva was despondent, and Narada Muni came and instructed him. And then chapter 7 up to 16, you have the disappearance of Lord Krishna and all of his associates, right? First of all, we had the disappearance of Grandfather Bhishma and then Dhritarashtra. And then you have the Yadu dynasty, the, the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, and then the disappearance of Lord Krishna, and then the Pandavas retire also. And then you have the cursing of Maharaj Parikshit and the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami. Right? So the, the, the first canto ended, ends with the meeting 
of Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami. So you will remember, of course, the question which was put by Maharaj Parikshit to Sukadeva Goswami. Right? Does someone like to tell me what was Maharaj Parikshit's question to Sukadeva Goswami? Yes, Prabhu. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the question uh, what he put to Sukhdev Goswami is this, what is the specific duty of all uh, human being and what is the specific duty of a person who is dying? Yes. Also, also, another set of questions asked was uh, what are the things to be remembered? What are the things to be chanted? And uh, what are the uh, things to be heard? Right. And what are things not to be heard? What are things not to be chanted? And what are things not to be remembered? <laughs> okay, very good, yeah. Very nice, okay. So you've, you've got that clear. All right, so in the second canto, just to show you what's going to be covered in the second canto, we'll begin the first three chapters, uh, the three steps, first three steps of God-realization, or the three steps, you could say, Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan, right? The three steps of God-realization. That's the first three chapters. And then the fourth chapter, you have questions by Maharaj Parikshit, and you have Sukadeva Goswami offering prayers. The questions which Maharaj Parikshit asked were so deep and demanding Sukadeva Goswami took shelter of the Lord by offering very nice prayers to be empowered to reply to all of his questions. And then the fifth chapter goes on to describe the process of creation, which is spoken by Brahma to Narada. And then that's what I'll be covering. And then you'll go on, the, the rest of the canto goes on. You've got the Purusha Shukta, with, with Lord Brahma's realization of the universal form and hearing about different Lila incarnations in the seventh chapter. And then more questions by Parikshit. And then chapter 9 you have the Chatur Sloki. And chapter 10 you have the 10 items, 10 topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And some explanation of the Chatur Sloki. So that's the contents of the second chapter, second canto rather. And here we have the first chapter, which we're going to be looking at today, the first step in God realization. So the chapter begins with making the best use of the human life and then goes into Bhakti Mishra Yoga. And then we'll hear about contemplating the universal form. And chapter 2, okay, then chapter 2 there, there's different things. Lord in the heart, detachment, meditation, destination, achieving the supreme destination. It's important for Maharaj Parikshit. At the time of death, we want to think about how to achieve that destination an attraction for Krishna, and then pure devotional service, a change in heart. Mm. Okay, so that's the third chapter. We want to go through all the details of the other chapters. We want to hear the connection of Cantos 1 and 2. Of course, as you just heard, as we just heard, Maharaj Parikshit had that wonderful question to ask. Uh, described here, O oh, trustworthy Brahmanas, I now ask you about my immediate duty. Please, after proper deliberation, tell me of the unalloyed duty of everyone in all circumstances and specifically of those who are just about to die. So that's, that's his question. And here's another 
the other question is, uh, you are, Maharaj Pariksha speaking, you are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees. I am therefore begging you to show me the way to perfection for all persons and especially for one who is about to die. Please let me know what a man should hear, chant, remember and worship and also what he should not do. Please explain all this to me. And we need to know what to do and what not to do. This is of course the principle of surrender as you studied in the Bhagavad Gita. Surrender, the first thing is to accept everything favourable and to reject then also what is not favourable. So Maharaj Parikshit, he wants to hear all of this from Sukadeva Goswami. They'd never met before, but by the grace of Krishna, providence arranged at the appropriate time, just before his coming death, Maharaj Parikshit had the opportunity to hear from this great son of Srila Vyasadeva. And so he's put that very powerful question to him. Uh, from the first chapter of the fifth verse, Prabhupada's purport, or oh, no, Prabhupada's lecture, Prabhupada's lecturing on this verse. Question was about Krishna, and the reply is Srimad Bhagavatam. 18,000 verses and each and every verse is so important that if a serious student studies each and every verse, each verse will take at least one month to understand. And there are 18,000 verses. So for serious study of Srimad Bhagavatam, it will take 18,000 months. So 18,000 months, meaning how many years? 1,500 years. <laughs> so Prabhupada telling us here, study the Srimad Bhagavatam seriously, each verse takes one month. Actually, somebody, some, sometimes devotees count the verses and they say, you know, I counted all the verses and there are not 18,000 verses there. It adds up to something like 12,000 or more. Have any of you done it? Did any of you ever count the number of verses in Srimad Bhagavatam? No? Anyway, if you count according to the, as we have listed the verses, it's not 18,000. But the Acharyas explain actually it's 18,000 because some of the verses, a number of verses are in prose and they're divided, they're, they're more than one verse. And when you calculate like that, then it will come to 18,000 verses. So it's, there's, there's a specific meter or uh, dimension in each verse. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Mayapur Dham Chiki Jai. Would someone like to read this for me, please? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavad Pranam. The topics of Lord Krishna are so auspicious that they purify the speaker, the hearer and the inquirer. They are compared to the Ganges water, which flow from the toe of Lord Krishna. Wherever the Ganges waters go, they purify the land and the person who bathes in them, similar, bathes in them. similarly, the topics of Krishna are so pure that Wherever they are spoken, 
the place, the hearer, the inquirer, the speaker, and all concerned becomes purified. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.1.1 Karpo. Thank you. So, this point actually, I remember reading this in the very first book which I contacted in Krishna Consciousness, which was the Krishna book. In, in, in relation to the Krishna book, on the introduction to the book, Srila Prabhupada wrote about this, how everyone benefits by hearing topics of Lord Krishna. The speaker, the hearer and the inquirer. So, and Prabhupada mentions here even the place where it's spoken also becomes purified, becomes a holy place. Okay. Oh. What happened here? How did that get here? Something. Okay. All right, so Sukadeva Goswami begins the chapter. Actually, the chapter begins by the invocation from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. I was in Dallas when Srila Prabhupada came there. And we were at, at Dallas at that time, we had the Gurukula. Later on, the Gurukula was moved to Vrindavan. They, they have a day school there now in Dallas now. But in Prabhupada's time, we had the Gurukula and we had all the young boys there. And so we began the Srimad Bhagavatam class, you know, we chanted the invocation, Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. And then Prabhupada turned to all the children and he asked them, So, what is the meaning? Prabhupada wanted to make sure the children were not just mechanically learning. He wanted them to actually understand what they were learning. And so he was asking them, what is the meaning? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So the second canto begins by offering our obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We're approaching this very important subject matter so it's very uh, relevant for us to offer our prayers and offer our respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord. So Sukadeva Goswami begins a chapter by talking about materialistic life that there are many subject matters for people to hear, many different subject matters, and people can easily waste their life in mundane pursuits. He's, he talks about the difference between Grihastha life and Grihamedi life. So Grihastha life, Grihastha is an ashram an ashram for spiritual advancement. And Griha Medi, Prabhupada explained, Medi means envious. So the Griha Medi, is in, his business is envy, envious, be, to be envious of others. So Grihastha life, however, is meant for spiritual advancement. So we want to understand clearly what is materialistic life. How do we understand it? Would, actually, let's go ahead and look at this question here. They said, what, are, what, what do you consider some symptoms of Grihamedi life? You've studied the first canto, you've, you've, we've, and 
you, you've heard about people like Drita Astra, and Prabhupada does talk about Grihamedi life in that section. So, can, would you like to give one symptom about Grihamedi? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, uh, one of the symptoms that I feel is one who is too attached to the householder life that he forgets that the main purpose of this human life is spiritual realization. Okay, so you're saying that the symptom will be. Can you could you tell me something about like what will he be doing? You know what will he what what will his act? You know you say he's too attached, but can how will he show that? How will that attachment manifest? So, uh, Maharaj, the attachment will manifest by uh, thinking that me and mine. So it is all, my family is my own and all others are not my own. So that's why he develops envy. And uh, all his activities and times and efforts will be spent to keep him, ha his senses happy and his family happy. And in the daytime, uh, he will only utilize the daytime for uh, earning money so that he can uh, give his sense enjoyment uh, for himself and his family. And in the night time, he will only think about his uh, materialistic life and how to create more progeny. So these are a few symptoms. <laughs> how to create more progeny. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, interesting. So he's thinking about money, right? He's, so he's very active. That's certainly a big concern, you know. Of course, who, who doesn't think about money, you know. Everybody needs money. Even in our Krishna consciousness movement, we think about money also. Mm. And, we, and then, so you, you mentioned particularly money, and then having more children or sex life, that, you know, that, that's certainly there, you know. That could be also a symptom. Uh, would anybody else like to add anything to this? Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, you know, his part of life is how to eat well, how to uh, sleep well, how to defend well, and how to uh, mm -hmm. eat well. That's what is this is my part of his life. Actually. Yeah, he's, he likes to have nice eating and nice sleeping, you know. People, some people nowadays, they, they get water beds, you know, they think this is nice way to sleep, nice thing to sleep on, a water bed. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the business of the Grihamedi, they want the home should be very luxurious, spacious. And this, yes, Prabhu? They do not think about retirement. They want to continue their enjoyment and don't think about the uh, ultimate goal. No, oh, keep working and eh? work till they drop. Mm. That's not very good, is it? Yes, we should certainly plan the life. We should plan, make some plan. We don't want to keep working. The Vedic system was there. By the age of 50, there should be retirement. Not that you keep working. That was the Vedic system. Prabhupada said, why? And he said, because it takes time to develop detachment. And if we keep working, then you have less time at the end of life. It does take time to prepare ourselves, to detach ourselves from the world. So retirement is... The, I've, I've met people who told me they will just work till they drop. And they just accept that that's their life. They will keep working until they drop. That is mudha. It's great Hamedi life. Not good. Yes, thank you Prabhu. Anything else? 
they, they don't follow any scriptures they don't follow any spiritual guidance uh, because of that they will be always bewildered and they are always fearful okay yes they don't they don't care very much to hear the message of the the sadhus <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, they do not inquire into the problems of life and it's uh, written in text 4. They don't inquire why problems are happening in their life. Yes, they're not inquiring. They don't have that feeling that they need to try to understand life. They're so busy trying to enjoy life. They don't think to ever ask why. They, they don't ask about how to avoid the problems of old age and disease and death. So, of course, this, this chapter actually began with Sukadeva Goswami praising Maharaj Pariksit. He said that your question is glorious because it is very beneficial to all kinds of people. The answer to this question is the prime subject matter for hearing. So Sukadeva Goswami was praising Maharaj Pariksha. He said, this question is glorious, very beneficial to all kinds of people. Hmm. We see everywhere in the world questions and answers are there. You go to the market, it's all questions and answers. You go in the court, you go in the office, everywhere questions and answers. But their questions are not beneficial. Just simply entangled, just simply becoming more entangled in the material world. So. Five symptoms of the Grihamedis. Let's see, we have something here. I have to go back. Oh. I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint. It's not working properly. Okay, anyway. What we should not do, right? It's going to, Maharaj Parikshit was asked to describe, he wanted to know what we should do and what we should not do. So Sukadeva Goswami began, first of all, by appreciating the question which Maharaj Parikshit had asked. And then he's speaks about what we should not do, first of all. Before he says what we should do, first he's going to say what we shouldn't do. So he's telling us actually about Grihamedi life, how we shouldn't waste our human life. And we see one of the businesses in the Grihamedi life, hearing mundane topics, uh, you know, mundane homes, they will be very fond of movies and watching Bollywood mu movies and television and these kind of things. We'll spend a lot of time doing these things. And then, of course, nowadays everybody has mobile phones and we're, we're talking a lot and hearing from different people and people are sending so many things on the, in, on the mobile phone, the mobile network, you get so many things. So we hear so many mundane topics. It's very hard to protect yourself from the mundane. Everywhere they're giving you news, even you drive the car, they have big uh, screens, LCD screens up with pictures of movies and different highlights of things going on, what's happening. It's very hard to avoid the mundane topics. And then of course, running after money the whole day. Well, certainly we have families to support, we have to work. 
it's a responsibility. But it, it shouldn't be the whole day, not to the extent that we sacrifice every minute of our time. Some people have more than one job. They work in the day, they work in the night, and then another job on the weekend. And that's not uncommon. So the money's never enough. You always want, we always want more. It's very difficult to balance. And then sleeping or having sex the whole night. So that materialistic life, people, they want sleep and they want to eat, fill the belly, they can sleep nicely, then enjoy the fair sex. And then also, they take shelter. They do have a shelter, but who is the shelter for the materialistic people? Who are these fallible soldiers? Someone can tell me, who are the fallible soldiers? Wife, wife. So, who? I think their, their wife, their children, their relatives, money, all this will come to their aid. Yes. Same position. Okay. Yeah, make it. But the fallible soldiers. Often it's well, we we surround ourselves just like a king will have an army, and the army will be around the palace to protect the king. So the same way we live in our home and we have our family members and our relatives and our dog and our doctors and our lawyers and all these people, they're all there to protect us. So in this way we pass our time, right? So the third verse is like that, mentioning this uh, The envious householder, the lifetime of such an envious householder passed at night, either in sleeping or in sex indulgence and in the daytime, either in making money or maintaining family members. It's not a crime to make money or to maintain family members. And sex is also allowed in the in the material world, of course. People get married and they expect to have some pleasure and they take pleasure in that relationship with the, fair, with the opposite sex. But that shouldn't be the whole focus of life. That is the point, that our life shouldn't just be focused only on these things. There has to be more and there has to be some effort, some endeavor to inquire into the purpose of life. Not just simply take shelter of fallible soldiers. They will protect me. I depend on them. We get sick. The fallible soldier. Call the doctors like this. And so people are very blind to what the goal of human life is. And they waste their time like not a totally waste your time. I mean, of course, you have to do these things, but they don't have any higher purpose in life. That is the point. That they never inquire about why. Why I'm here. What is the goal? What's behind all this? Isn't there some higher purpose than just eating and sleeping and mating and defending? Yeah, all right, you need these things, but there's something more than that. That means to inquire. So, Sukadeva Goswami, he's preaching to Maharaj Parikshit. Remember, Maharaj Parikshit's come here to prepare for death. So, Sukadeva Goswami is preaching very strongly, he's, you know, because he has to encourage him. Remember, he's only seven days. So, he wants to encourage him. And 
then Maharaj Pariksit, he's also fasting. He's not even drinking water. He's so determined. So Sukadeva Goswami really wants to make a full impression on him that you're, you've done the right thing. Don't waste your life. Don't waste any moment. You don't have many moments left anyway, so don't waste any time. Here you can see the position. They're blind. They're thinking that these things will give him protection. Pramata. Pramata means crazy. By craziness he is thinking, these things will give me protection. We need some shelter, but these things, this uh, money and family members, and the relatives, the doctors, the lawyers, they're not going to protect us. They cannot save us from the time of death, at the time of death. <laughs> Here's our soldiers. You can see maybe this is Afghanistan or somewhere, I don't know, <laughs> Middle East, fallible soldiers. So we have our fallible soldiers, uh, they don't have machine guns, but still, uh, we look to them to protect us, and to give us shelter, to save us. I remember there was this one devotee, he was an American body devotee, he was from a, a wealthy Jewish family. So he was describing how his, his father got very sick and his, his, his father turned to his wife, who was the mother of the devotee, and he said to her, can't you do something to help me? You know, he was, in, he was really feeling pain and he was in some serious health condition. So he was pleading to his wife, can't you do something to help me? And she looked at him and she said, Oh, Lawrence, what can I do? <laughs> you know, she, she admitted she couldn't do anything. But he was thinking, you know, that maybe my wife, my wife should help me, my wife can save me. But she told him frankly, what can I do? I can't save you. So this is the position, material entanglement. We get very caught up. Would someone like to read for us from Prabhupada's lecture? Hare Krishna. They will, they all devotee the whole day for reading this newspaper. Sorry, they will, they all devote the whole day for reading this newspaper or some fiction, fiction or some novels for this and that. But they have no time to hear Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Apashyatam Atma Tattam because they have no interest in self-realization. People have lost all interest. This is the position. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is essential at the present moment. Srila Prabhupada's lecture. So what is the meaning? Apashyatam Atmatatvam? Apashyatam Atmatatvam because they, have, they, they, they don't see that self-realization. They don't see it. They are not able to see it. Yeah, do you know the verse where it's mentioned, Apashyatam Atmatatvam? I think it's the first verse in the, this, this second canto, actually. It's the fourth verse, Maharaj. It's the fourth verse, is it? Okay, do you know the verse, Maharaj? Sorry, sorry, it's Pashyan Apina Pashyati, sorry. <laughs> it is the first verse, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's first. Uh, uh, should I read the second? Verse? Second verse. The second verse. The second verse. Okay. Yes, go second. ahead, read it. Shrota Vyati Virajendra Nanam Santi Sahas Vashaha Apashita Matmatatvam Krihe Shukriha Medinam. Oh, very nice. Read the translation. Those persons who are materially engrossed, being blind to the knowledge of ultimate truth, lead 
many subject matters for hearing in human society. Oh, Anjar. Yes, they have many subject matters, right? Sahasrasha, Sahasrasha, hundreds and thousands. And Apashyatam, of the blind. So they're, they're blind to self realization They don't know Atmatattva. They don't know the science of the soul. But they have many, so many things, right? They're reading the newspapers, they have so many novels, they have so many things to talk, but everything is forgotten. So, we are trying to give people this knowledge, Srimad Bhagavatam. We want them to understand Krishna Consciousness. Try to save them from the hellish life. All right, so Sukadeva Goswami has begun with his criticism of the, well, I won't say criticism, but his exposure of materialistic life. Sukadeva Goswami has described what is this materialistic life, what's it like, and how it's just simply a waste of time, useless endeavor for simply sense gratification cannot give any solution to the problems of life. So he began like that, and then the chapter will go on, verses 5 and 6, we will hear what everyone should do. And then we'll hear about hearing and chanting, and the activity of the liberated souls, and he will give examples himself. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna was speaking about examples, about uh, detached workers who perform their duty, and he gave the example of Janaka Maharaj, then he gave himself as an example. So here also, Sukadeva Goswami gives himself as an example. It's important, when we're presenting something, we have to believe it ourselves. There's that story about uh, the, the lady brought the, her son to the doctor, and she asked the doctor to tell her son not to eat sweets all the time. So the doctor said, okay, can you come back after a week? So after a week they came back and the doctor told the boy, don't eat sweets. And so the lady said, but why didn't you tell him that a week ago? So the doctor said, well, a week ago I was eating sweets a lot. So if I'm going to tell him not to eat sweets, I also have to not eat sweets. So it's important, we're teaching something, we have to also practice it ourselves. Otherwise our preaching, our talking will be useless. Alright, in verse 10, qualifications and benefits for hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. 11, the way of success. And then 12 to 14, the good fortune of Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit is very fortunate. Yes, it's a very good fortune. What is this good fortune? What do you think? He had, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, he had seven days. Actually, uh, the example also is given of Katpan Maharaj, that uh, one moment itself was sufficient for him to get liberated. And here, he had seven full days. So, uh, he had the chance of hearing and then he can get liberated. Yes, he's got warning, he can prepare, and he's also got the good association, Krishna has sent him Sukadeva Goswami to guide him. And so many other saintly sages have also come to hear and to be with him, to prepare at that time. So with the right association, very helpful. Okay. Oh. Uh, qualification of the ideal here. So this comes up in text number, let's see, text number five. Text number five. 
descendant of Bharat, one who desires to be free from all miseries, must hear about, glorify and also remember the personality of Godhead, who is the super soul. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing here what we should do, right? That we, we have to spend, we have to hear and chant and we shouldn't get caught in the clutches of material existence. Have to, we have to hear, but then who are we going to hear from? That's important, but also the hearer has to be right. Just like in the first canto, in the very first chapter, you have questions by the sages, right? Questions by the sages are put there. And Prabhupada, in the purport, he describes there how the speaker has to be qualified and the audience, they also have to be qualified. It's not just only that you get the powerful speaker come and then he can liberate everyone. You may have the best teacher, but if the students are no good, then what can the teacher do? He will have a hard time, it will be very difficult for him. So very important for us that as hearers, what, are the, what is the proper qualification for a, someone to hear this knowledge of Srimad Bhagavatam? Would someone like to give us some some idea what they think is the proper qualification. Of course, certain things you shouldn't do, like, you know, you don't want to be with your handphone when you're hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. You want to leave your handphone aside or you want to at least shut out all messages and all telephone calls. That would be an important qualification. Right? That you're, you're focused on hearing. And if, if you have your handphone with you, we know how these mobile phones, they do take a lot of attention from us. So it's really important for us to get the right mood in hearing. We want to hear carefully. And so long as we're holding these phones in our hand and we're thinking about our home or our job or our customers or whatever, it's not the same. You have to, we have to really focus carefully on the hearing. So this is one point, I think. Any, any other thing? One has to be submissive and give respect to the speaker, all, kind of, all kinds of respect to the speakers. Okay. And it should have full faith on the speaker and it should be enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, enthusiasm, that's also a very good qualification for the audience, that they're enthusiastic, that they're always there on time and they're very attentive and they, they're eager to hear and put questions. Very nice, yes, enthusiasm. Prabhupada liked that. He liked to see the enthusiasm of the devotees. Also, he must have faith and flinching faith on the Supreme Lord. Yes, he should He have... must also be the pure devotee of the Lord. Oh, I don't know. Do you really think that's a necessary qualification? I think if that's the qualification, many of us wouldn't come. We think I'm not qualified. You know, because... Uh, no, I, I, I meant that he must have faith on the Supreme Lord uh, Krishna. Sorry. Yes, yeah, we have to have faith in Lord Krishna. But we shouldn't, I don't think we want to think that we're pure devotees. We'd like to become pure devotees, but that would be good, that we have the desire to become purified. So that's a good thing, that, you know, I'd like to become a pure devotee one day. I'd like, you know, I'd like at least to get purification that's why I want to hear. I know that this, this uh, process, this hearing will help to purify me. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, some uh, qualification that we get from Bhagavad Gita is Pranipata, Pariprasnena and Sevaya. So these three moods should be there with the hearer. Yeah, can you explain them? Uh, so he should be able to surrender to the teacher with uh, full faith that his teacher can help like how Srila Parikshit Maharaj had full faith on uh, Srila Shukadev Goswami. So that is Pranipat and uh, Prabhupada says that he should be like a blank board. Uh, he should not bring different other mental concoction. So that is uh, Pranipat. And then he should have uh, very appropriate questions uh, related to spiritual life, uh, which is Pariprasnena. And then he should have a desire to serve by hearing and also uh, whatever way the teacher wants. Uh, in that mood, in a humble servant mood, he should uh, be able to serve the teacher. Okay, yes, and how do, in the purport um, 434 in Bhagavad Gita, how does Prabhupada describe uh, this Pariprasnena? He said, questions should not be of a particular nature. Uh, it should not be in a uh, challenging mood. Challenging. And also, he mentions foolish, foolish inquiries. Just like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Or can God make a stone so heavy even he can't lift it? You know, these kind of foolish questions. So, or can you, you know, we don't come to the spiritual teacher to ask him for the lucky number to win, win the lottery <laughs> or things like this, you know. And so, okay, Pariprasna, yes. The questions must be relevant to Krishna consciousness and to our spiritual progress. That's the idea. All right, so nice yeah, that we have faith and we're focused and attentive and we want to really get purified. So, uh, here the process which of hearing is described here, Harinam Anukirtanam. Anukirtanam means constant chanting, right? Constant chanting of the holy name. Just as Lord Chaitanya said, Kirtaniya Sadahari. So this is a, the, what we want to encourage, constant chanting. In Sridhar Swami's commentary, he says, there's no other method of self-realization more beneficial than this, than hearing, chanting the holy name. Hearing and chanting the holy name, very, very powerful and effective in giving us purification and elevating our consciousness to the transcendental platform. And Jiva Goswami adds the condition, one must avoid nam aparat, right? Sridhar Swami says chant constantly and Jiva Goswami says one thing, avoid nam aparat in order to achieve the ultimate result of chanting. So it's not just chanting, but it's offenseless chanting. Chanting without offense, that will give us the real benefit. Then Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, he explains that among the angas of bhakti, Hearing, chanting and remembering are the three chief ones. This has been stated in verse 5. Among these three, chanting is the chief. Chanting is the chief because it includes also, when the chanting is performed properly, then the chanting will include hearing and remembering. It's included within the chanting. When we chant properly, we will also hear and we will also remember. So the, that's why chanting is the chief.
such chanting should be anukirtana, constant following in the footsteps of previous authorities and according to the level of one's realization. So everyone can chant. You see, this is the wonderful thing about the kirtan process that is beneficial for everyone. It doesn't matter who they are or what position they're in in the society doesn't matter if you're very low-born or uh, contaminated or diseased. doesn't matter what your sex is or if you're young or old. Anyone in any condition of life, they can benefit. They can be immediately purified by the process of properly chanting the holy name. So, you could try this just for a, a little while. We want to know how you can counteract offences to the Holy Name. What kind of strategies or what is your own... We, not, we all know we have problems in trying to chant properly. So, what kind of uh, defence do you have? What do you do? to help yourself avoid offences to the Holy Name. Is it possible? How many people do we have here this morning? You have 23, Maharaj. So, 24. Okay. So can we, can we put people in pairs and they can just discuss for a few minutes? Just because I think you can open up more if you talk with a partner rather than we just have an open class discussion. If you go in pairs and discuss, what is your strategy to help you chant better to, with more attention and to avoid the offences? Because generally the main offence which we have comes in the form of inattentive chanting. Mind is not focused, inattention. Mm. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. You're Vrindavan Chandra, is it? Yeah, I'm Radha Vrindavan Chandra Das. Radha Vrindavan Chandra. Okay, Prabhu. So, how do you defend yourself against inattentive or offensive chanting? So, Maharaj Ji, uh, while chanting, I, I try to concentrate and try to listen to what I'm chanting. What do you do to help you listen to what you're chanting? So I, I speak loudly. Chant loudly. Yeah. That's I good. speak loudly the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and uh, listen to that. Okay. And do you have anybody around you at the time when you're chanting? Do you have people around you? Yeah, normally I do it at my home only. My wife and my son are there. So sometimes they are there or sometimes I'm alone in the room. Mm -hmm. Do they chant? Yeah, my wife chants. Okay, and no, no problem, no complaints from anybody when you chant. No, 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 no problem from anyone. Normally, normally I, I chant uh, before the Gaur Nithai Vigra or the Tulsi plant. So you don't have any trouble in your chanting at all. You're quite focused. Yeah, I, with my my mind wanders here and there. Uh, because my office work and some of my tension in my life is also there, so my mind wanders. <coughs> but then I try to pull my mind back and chant, so all those things are there, some problems there. Okay. Any other offences you might have in chanting? Um, 
I, I try to avoid the Vaishnava Prad. I don't uh, even, in my mind also, I don't think think uh, any ill about any of my uh, colleagues, Vaishnavas. You have good my relationships Shukuru. with everybody. Yeah, yeah, good relationships, yes. That's good. And you read the books regularly? Yes, uh, the Bhagavatam class, the CBAs and OBS are continuously preparing only. So I keep on reading these books. So you're following all the instructions of the spiritual master? Yes, I'm following the instructions. The four regulative principles that I have uh, definitely follow. And uh, yeah, there's not no specific service given to me by my spiritual master, but I am related to the Iskon uh, nearby temple. So whatever services they are giving me, uh, like they need some monetary help for the construction of the temple, that I do, I regularly attend the programs uh, that is held every Sunday. I go there. Every Sunday? Yeah. In Mumbai, basically I'm from Mumbai. Right, from so Mumbai. in Mumbai, yeah, uh, there's a temple nearby. So uh, I daily, I, every Sunday I go there and attend the program. Hare Krishna Maharaj, that are pranams. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, how long we have to keep this uh, breakout room, song? Well, yeah, we could close it now. We'll close it? Okay. Yes. Okay, would somebody like to share with us? Recording what? in progress. <laughs> All right, I'd like to hear. Anybody, did, did you come up any good, uh, any, you found out any good uh, strategy to counteract offensive chanting? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, one of the uh, things is to take shelter of the pure devotee. That means once they take the um, shelter of the pure devotee, they will come to the understanding who Krishna is and then they start worshipping Krishna. By gradually worshipping, when they start worshipping Krishna, and they, all this, um, this one we can take defense of the, this Nama Pradas, will be, we can take the defense against the Nama Pradas and we can start uh, chanting very effectively. Okay. Take shelter of the pure devotee means take initiation or something. Take shelter means it means you take it and then you go ahead and take initiation after some time, is it? Like that? Do you mean like that? Yeah, the once the moment we start taking shelter of the pure devotee, we will come to know uh, who Krishna is and then by their association we start worshipping Krishna. Once we start worshipping Krishna, all this Namara Pradas will come down. Okay. Anybody else? Krishna Maharaj. Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Go ahead, Maharaji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. We can sit in front of the deity, Tulsi Maharani. We have to chant loudly. Early morning chanting will help us. And reading Sishtash to come, 10 offenses, all these also help us give the right mood to chant properly and most important not to commit any Vaishnava Aparat because that is going to have an impact on our chanting. And we can also have uh, Japa marathons and things like that which also increase our days for chanting. So these are different ways we can help ourselves not to commit any offenses towards the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. And always be thankful to the Lord that we have been given this opportunity to take his names because any time that can be withdrawn. So every moment we should be thankful that we are in this moment and the Lord has been merciful that we got this opportunity. Very good. Very good. I think you covered everything. I couldn't think of any more things to say. Thank you, Samarai. Yes, Prabhu. So, yeah, uh, main... Uh, uh, things which uh, you know diverting our mind is that gadgets so that gadgets as you put aside 
and uh, sit in front of the day, you know, to receive, as Mataji said, so chant the holy name. And also the affirmation, what we chant, like, you know, uh, we welcome the holy names, uh, you know, uh, every Japa session. So that affirmation, what we uh, chant also, it has to be meditated upon. And accordingly, uh, we have to chant the holy name. Yes. Very good. Yes, you're right. Yeah, get all the gadgets out of the way and just focus on the holy name. Fine. Okay. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, it is also important to uh, meditate on Lord's uh, forms, pastimes. Well, while chanting. Well, the, the important thing in our in a neophyte stage, the important thing is to hear the holy name. And when we hear the holy name properly, then within the holy name we will also naturally think of the Lord's pastimes. Not that we should force ourselves to think of the Lord's pastimes, but remembrance of the Lord's pastimes, if they come naturally, then there's no harm. But the main thing is to hear. When devotees would ask what to do with the mind, Prabhupada said, it's not a question of the mind. You use the tongue to chant and the ear to hear. That's japa. You don't have to think about the mind, I have to meditate on Krishna. Because if you use the mind and you're meditating on Krishna's pastime, you won't be hearing the holy name. Because you'll be thinking of the pastime. There are times when you can think of the Lord's pastimes, that's all right. But when you're chanting the holy name, we have to focus on the hearing. Because if, if you start thinking on the Lord's pastime, you won't hear the chanting. You won't know what you're, you're chanting. It won't be so effective. The process is hearing and chanting the holy name. In the Kali Yuga, it's especially the chanting of the holy name. So we, we really focus on that. We want to uh, hear the holy name. And when we hear naturally, as we hear nicely, then naturally remembrance of Lord Krishna will come into our heart. Okay, so thank you for your participation here. Here's a quote. Inattention, the main offence. Haridas spoke to Lord Chaitanya. Inattention is counted as one of the apparatus. Even if one successfully overcomes all the other offences in chanting, and one is chanting continuously, love of God may not come. One should know that the reason for this is that one is committing the offence known as pramada or inattention. This offence will block progress to prem. So, attentive chanting, that's why we say get all the gadgets out of the way, you know, and really concentrate on the holy name. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he has his house over here in Mayapur at Swarup Ganj, just across the Jalangi from Mayapur. And it said he used to sit there on the roof and he would cover himself with a blanket. He'd put a blanket over his head. And in this way he would, you know, he wouldn't get absorbed in things which were going on around. Because the nature of the mind is always looking for other things. So even with the blanket over the head, still the mind could be thinking other things. But it's, it's an attempt, anyway, to try to concentrate the mind, to focus the mind. So attention has to be there, the attention in hearing and in chanting. So, as we said, chanting is the, the main thing, and when chanting is done properly, then we will also hear and we will also remember. The antidote to an uncontrolled mind. And yeah, very difficult to control the mind. We, we have that problem, the uncontrolled mind. But there is a quality to such utterances also. It depends on the quality of feeling. 
It's a quote from Srila Prabhupada's uh, prayers by Queen Kunti. You covered in the first canto. So Prabhupada mentioned there in the purport that there's a quality to, and it depends on the quality of feeling. So when we chant, just like one of the devotees, my God brother, Sachinanda and Swami, when, when we do kirtan, he will say, chant, chant from the heart, chant from the heart. So that's the idea that we really want to chant from the heart, the feeling is there. And Prabhupada described that feeling, he said, the chanting should be done. What was the mood? Does anybody know? Prabhupada said, what should be the feeling when we're chanting? It should be what? What did you say, Prabhu? I said, Prabhu, uh, Maharaj, humble. It should be in a humble mood. Humble. Well, that's not what I was thinking. Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, yes, Maharaj uh, Prabhupada says that you should cry out like a child, like a baby crying out for a mother. Yes, right. Yes. That's what I was thinking of, right. The quality of feeling, just like the child, when the child calls for its mother, then that feeling is there, that only the mother will satisfy the crying of the child. And so the same way, when we are chanting the names of Lord Krishna, we're calling out to him, and he's the one who's really going to satisfy us and uh, give us what we want, what we're looking for. Okay, so effort is the, gate, the gateway from Nama Parad to Nama Bas. Right? If we chant with Nama Bas, that's the liberating stage. If we chant with Nama, Nama Parad, then we may chant the holy name for many lifetimes, but we will not get the ultimate goal of this chanting, love of God. We'll never get love of God by chanting Nama Parad. We want to come to at least that stage of Nam Abbas. So that is, requires some effort to come to that stage. Unless we extend our best efforts earnestly and qualify ourselves for the Lord's mercy, it is next to impossible that we can be rescued from our fallen condition. So this effort has to be there. We really, really, we're really desperate. We really want to get out. And then one more quote from Srimad Bhagavatam. Revival of the dormant affection or love of Godhead does not depend on the mechanical system of hearing and chanting, but it solely and wholly depends on the causeless mercy of the Lord. When the Lord is fully satisfied with the sincere efforts of the devotee, he may endow him with his loving transcendental service. That is from Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 7, verse number 6, purport. So, the mercy of Krishna, we, need, we want to get the mercy. It's not just our own mechanical efforts, but it's, uh, we need the mercy of Krishna. And, of course, we get the mercy of Krishna by our own sincere effort. So that effort has to be there, make the effort. Sometimes people are apathetical about the chanting, Apathy. Apathy, you know, we're always, we have to always fight against apathy, even in our Krishna consciousness movement. We get a lot of people who are apathetical. Oh, it's not important. Oh, don't take it so seriously. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, why are you worried? You know, <laughs> you know like that. So effort is required. Here we say, physiology affects psychology and we can feel it when when we're chanting how the mind is affected if you move the eyes around the room 
the mind will be affected, you focus, you see different things, or we chant while either closing our eyes or staring at one object, we chant sitting calmly without shaking the body. Chant, moving, shaking the body. I was watching this morning when I was chanting Japa. I was also moving a bit, you know. Sometimes it helps you, you know, a bit to move. I keep the, you shake a bit back and forth, back and forth. Chant while sitting straight with the big bag over your heart. Chant while passionately walking around the room. Place your hands in pranam mudra over your heart. Cross your arms over your chest. Stand up, raise your arms in the air and smile. For fun, try to be depressed while maintaining this posture. <laughs> so, of course, you stand up, raise your arms in the air and smile. Could you be depressed? I don't think so. So, definitely, the physiology does affect our psychology. We want to be conscious. It is said that if you chant walking around, that's more of the mode of passion. And you chant laying down, that's chanting more in the mode of ignorance. And if you chant uh, sitting, that's more in the mode of goodness. To chant sitting. Lokana Swami described when he first, when he was a new devotee, he, and he was moving his legs up and down, up and he was sitting, but he was moving his ankles, his or his knees, up and down. And Prabhupada pointed him, stop it, <laughs> stop it. So he didn't want him to be doing that. And then uh, we hear also Prabhupada when we're chanting Japa, there's a Japa tape of Prabhupada chanting, and Prabhupada said, sit properly. So sitting properly means you don't put your arms around your, around your legs, you should sit like a yogi, sit straight. Said so if, if the back bends, you go to sleep. If the head goes down, you go to sleep. So you want to sit up and sit straight. And if you close your eyes and you don't move, Prabhupada said that's sleeping. Prabhupada was giving a lecture and he said to the devotee, you're sleeping. And then the devotee said, Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping, I'm not sleeping. Prabhupada said to him, he said, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, then you're asleep. <laughs> so we have to be careful in chanting. It's very good, you were saying uh, we can avoid offenses, offensive chanting by chanting loudly. This is certainly true. Many, all, you know, people like Haridas Thakur, Kolaveka Sridhar, they chanted loudly, very powerful, loud chanting of the Holy Name. So creating a favorable life lifestyle for chanting the Holy Name, a favorable lifestyle has a lot to do with how successfully we're able to chant the Holy Name. What good habits could we incorporate in our lives in order to improve our japa? I think you've covered that already. We, many of you were saying we chant in front of the deities. That's very good. If you can chant in, in your temple room, in front of the deities. But it's not wrong to go for a walk. And in fact, Vishwanath uh, Prabhupada quotes, no, is it, no, Burijan Prabhu quotes in his book, Surrender Unto Me, that uh, I think it's Baladev Vijabhusan or Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, one of them, he said, in the morning you go for a Japa walk. He said, it's uh, good. And we see Prabhupada used to go for a Japa walk in the morning. Doctor actually told him, he said, Swamiji, you should go for a walk every day. He said, it would be good for your heart. So Prabhupada began every morning, he would go for a walk. And usually it would be a Japa walk, but often he would also talk and preach to people. So, it's not wrong to go for a walk. 
and chant. You can do it. But you have to be careful, you have to concentrate, and you have, it's more difficult to focus because so many distractions are there. So ideally you want to be able to chant in a place where you're not going to get distracted. Now if you're watching children, then it's very difficult. And having children around, children need your attention. You cannot expect that you can sit and chant peacefully while you're watching a child. Children need your attention. So you have to chant when the child's sleeping or when the child's at school or something. Okay, any questions or comments on this? Yes. Sometimes I feel like sleeping in one chanting. How to avoid this? Stand up, open the window, chant louder. I said sleeping comes. The, you, if you sit down and you, you let the back bend and the head go down and the eyes close, you'll go to sleep. Yes. So you have to sit straight. If you're going to sit, you have to sit up. Keep the back straight and keep the head up and keep the eyes open. And chant louder. That will also help. And often you sleep because you have... You have the, the room very warm, stuffy, no fresh air. So open the window or just get up. You can stand up and chant. You don't need to sit. If you stand up, I don't think you'll fall asleep. Okay. Aligning your life with the holy name. What do you do outside of your 16 rounds? that nourishes your japa? And what do you do outside of your 16 rounds that hinders your japa? Okay, what nourishes our japa first? So, there must be a lot of things, good things you can do which help your japa. Who would like to say some things? Reading scriptures regularly. Yes, reading scriptures, very good. The Gita, but regulated way, regulated way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. The association of our devotees, being with devotees. Chant in the association of devotees? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, they should be serious devotees. If you, sometimes you get associated, you just talk. It becomes a conversation instead of japa. You just talk to each other. So that's, be careful. We see Haridas Thakur, he would go into, into the cave and chant on his own. So association, you, you're going to chant japa, you want to get association with senior devotees. And then they will inspire you more to chant. Attending Japa workshops, Alright, yes, go to the Japa workshop, would certainly help. Hear a lot about Japa and about the holy name and techniques and strategies. Yes. Okay, what should we do that hinders our Japa? Sleep well in time. Not take late uh, night food, that hinders your job. Taking heavy meal at night. Yeah, try, try to eat light in the night. When I became a devotee, uh, the system was, we were told, Prabhupada said, no grains after four o'clock in the afternoon. No grains after four in the afternoon. That means no rice, no chapati, no dal, no heavy food after four o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because you won't digest it. It will be in the stomach until the next day. So don't eat heavy at night. Eat light, very light. If you're, go if you're going to eat at all in the night, don't eat heavy. Well, one doctor actually came, he was treating Jayapitaka Maharaj, he was a Chinese doctor, and he said, I can cure any disease. 
They said, if you don't eat, you shouldn't eat after two o'clock in the afternoon. So he had that kind of re regime. He said, don't eat in the evening, it's very bad for health. So hinder Shurjapa. Some any other thing? Maharaj is indulging uh, mode of mode of uh, passion and uh, and also ignorance. That also affect your morning journey. In what way you indulge in the mode of passion? What are you doing? Means suppose you want to watch uh, too many things which is uh, not required for bhakti progress in the bhakti. So those things, you know, it will affect your japa. It will come in your japa time on this thing, what you watch. No. So, try to, of course, you have to work, you have to do things, you have to, <laughs> very difficult to avoid things <laughs> which are not in relation to our japa. There will be so many things you have to do. Work in a job, you have to do things, you have to talk to your boss, you have to talk to people in the office and so on. A little difficult to do that. But if you do a good sadhana in the morning, if you get the rounds done in the morning, then that helps you to get through the day, even though you have to associate with people who are not devotees and you have to be in a materialistic environment. But if you have a good sadhana, a good start to the day, you do 16 good rounds, then you can be confident you can go through the day. It will help you. But if you haven't done your 16 rounds in the morning and you have to go out and you have to go and deal with all these, then it's very difficult. It'll be very difficult. Now, we'll leave the rounds until late at night. Some people do it, but it's not the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, if we are indulged too much into social media, WhatsApp and Facebook, and then we see too many news, that affects our consciousness and that also affects the Japa next morning. Yes. Yes. Watching too many videos and different uh, amusements and entertainments and things which are all coming at you every moment on the internet and on the mobile phone so many things that are appearing all meant just to distract you to take your mind away from Krishna right so you have to be very careful of course you can't avoid these things sometimes you know you have jobs and so on that company will send you things. You have to do it, of course. But still, try to get a good start to the day. And the best way to start the day is by trying to finish 16 rounds of japa. Okay? So good japa, very important for us. All right? So. Decided truth. Nir in Nirnitam. According to Sri Sukadeva Goswami, the way of attaining success is an established fact, concluded not only by him, but also by all other previous acharyas. Therefore, there is no need of further evidence. This is text number 11. Just let me open up my book here. O King, because, yeah, speaking about the constant chanting of the O King, constant chanting of the holy name of the Lord after the ways of the great authorities is the doubtless and fearless way of success for all, including those who are free from all material desire. Those who are desirous of all material enjoyment and those who are self-satisfied by dint of transcendental knowledge. 
So this, this uh, constant chanting, this Anukirtanam, this is a sure way of success, as stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and recognized by all of the Acharyas also. Throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam, the chanting of the holy name of the Lord will be promoted, and the conclusion of the Srimad Bhagavatam also is presented. So, dealing with blasphemy, this is looking at text number 12 now. All right, text number 12 states, What is the value of a prolonged life which is wasted, inexperienced by years in this world? Better a moment of full consciousness, because that gives one a start in searching after his supreme interest. <laughs> So, quoting from the Markandeya Purana, Sri Goswamiji says that one should neither blaspheme the devotee of the Lord, nor indulge in hearing others who are engaged in belittling a devotee of the Lord. A devotee should try to restrict the vilifier by cutting out his tongue, and being unable to do so, one should commit suicide, rather than hear the blaspheming of the devotee of the Lord. The blasphemy, very nasty thing. We don't want to hear blasphemy of the Lord or of his devotees. Of course it happens. There are people who are very envious. We, we spoke about the envious, the Grihamedis. So there are many Grihamedis. Most of the population of the world are engaged in that kind of life. So we want to understand how to properly deal with people who are blasphemous. In the course of our preaching, we often meet people who are sometimes like that, very challenging, very nasty, very offensive. How to deal with them? Oh, before we go to Kapanga Maharaj. Hmm. Uh, the, the material energy is very powerful, so you get people who are often very, very nasty, they don't like to hear us chant, they don't like to see us chant, they don't like to see us have faith in something, and it, it's a challenge to their life also. When they see that we are happy chanting, then it's a challenge to them that their lifestyle is being threatened. And because their lifestyle is being threatened, therefore they also commit blasphemy. And they begin to attack us, criticize us. So we have to be careful about how we deal, how we react to these people. Of course, according to scriptures, it said, you should try to restrict him by cutting out his tongue. Or, we should commit suicide rather than here. 
So these are, of course, this is very extreme. <laughs> we don't want to really do these things. But this is what the Shastras say. And then we have also the example of Kadvanga Maharaj. Kadvanga Maharaj, let's mention next, after hearing about the chanting of the holy name, because one may consider that we don't have a lot of time, time is short, but then here's Kadvanga Maharaj, he only had a moment and he was able to get perfection. Right? So it's a better a moment of full consciousness that, than a long life of illusion. Prabhupada says, Shankaracharya was in this world for only 32 years. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in this world for only 48 years. Not very long lives, but they made great contributions to the world. So, better a moment of full consciousness than a long life like a tree. You know, the trees may live 500 years or even 5,000 years, but they don't make a great contribution. But if one has full consciousness, even for a moment, then he can make a much better con contribution. So, we want to we want to have you think about this today. This is a, uh, an evaluation exercise. Evaluate the above statement, the above statement with other scriptural evidences. Discuss the import of this statement, right? The statement was there in the previous verse. Better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. So, do we, do we, can we support this with evidence from scriptures? Right, we've mentioned here the aim and the objective the aim to develop our students' analytical, interpretative and evaluative skills, particularly in respect of the practical application of Shastric knowledge. And the objective, to consider apparently conflicting references and to still draw a conclusion consistent with both. So we have two quotes here. You have this one, text number, from text number 12, about one should try to restrict the vilifier by cutting out his tongue. So this is, you know, or then it says commit suicide. If we're unable to do that, of course we're cutting out someone's tongue. That's a very terrible thing. We don't do that. We're nonviolent. Devotees are nonviolent. But they said, if we can't do that, we should commit suicide. But then, here we have Maharaj Gatvanga saying, or in relation to Maharaj Gatvanga anyway, we're told, better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. So, would any of you happen to have any scriptural evidence in relation to either of these quotes? First of all, maybe let's talk about committing suicide. Do we have any Shastric quotes or Shastric examples about this? Vikishtu Maharaj, yeah. the Daksha Yajna of the Sati committed suicide when the, her husband was blasphemy in front of the Sabah. I'm sorry Prabhu, I couldn't catch everything you're saying. In the, in the, the Daksha Yajna, Daksha Yajna Sati committed suicide. The, uh, uh, the wife of uh, Lord Shiva. She could not tolerate the blasphemy against her husband. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, is, was she correct? Then, that time she committed suicide. So we should do the same? No, no. No, Maharaj. 
So do, are devotees allowed to commit suicide? No, Maharaj. Maharaj, but devotees are not supposed to commit suicide because uh, it is a body given by the Lord. That's what even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also instructed Sanatana Goswami when, uh, because he had um, uh, contacted a very deadly disease and he wanted to commit suicide, then um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave him these instructions. So, uh, when we come across these people, the best way for us is to avoid them completely so that they don't commit more offenses. To be completely away from them. All right, thank you, Maharaji. First of all, your answer about it, the committing suicide, yeah, you gave a nice example from the Shastra that Lord Chaitanya told Sanatana Goswami. He said, if I thought I could commit suicide, by committing suicide, I could go back to Godhead, then I would have done it a long time ago. Nobody goes back to Godhead by committing suicide. This is very wrong. It's a very bad thing to do. And we see also, not only Sanatana Goswami, Lord Chaitanya also told uh, Murari Gupta. Murari Gupta was keeping a knife and he was planning to commit suicide, to kill himself. And Lord Chaitanya came and took his knife away and told him, you cannot do this. He said, I won't let you do this. He said, this body belongs to Krishna. It's not ours to kill or to harm. So no one can commit suicide. It's, it's, it's sinful to do that. And so the scriptures prohibit. We should practice also non-violence, right? Ahimsa is one of the sub-principles sub of religion. And devotees, we should, as devotees, we should be non-violent. We can't be, even be violent to ourselves. So it's against the Shastra. Is that clear? Marriage. Of course, Prabhu gave the example about Mother Parvati, but we should understand Mother Parvati was not an ordinary soul. That she, by giving, she could give up her body and then she could take birth again and come back again to be the wife of Lord Shiva. She could come back in another form. She just committed suicide to give up her connection with her father, Daksha, because he was so offensive towards Lord Shiva, but she knew that she would take birth again, come back in another form to be the wife of Lord Shiva. Yes? Is it clear, everyone? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, then there's the next quote. What about this? A moment of full consciousness and a long life of illusion. Of course, I give two examples. I give Shankaracharya and Lord Chaitanya. Kulashekar Maharaj. Who? Kulashekar? Mukunda Mala Stotra. Mukunda Mala Stotra. Oh, very good. Yes. Tell us, Prabhu. Give more detail. You know the verse? I'm not remembering. Krishna Tvadiya Pada Pankaja Pancharantam Adhyayva Me Vishatu Manasara Jahamsa Prana Prayana Kapaye Kapavata Pitaye Kantavaro Dhanavido Smaranam Kutaste Yes, what's, it, what's the meaning? Let my mind uh, be at the lotus feet of Krishna now and otherwise uh, at the tag end of my life my throat will be choked and I may not take the holy name. Yes, now while I'm healthy I can still chant the holy name and my mind is entangled at the lotus feet of Krishna I can chant the name. But if I have to wait for my natural death my throat may be choked up and I may not be able to chant, so better I die now. Let me die now. <laughs> That's Maharaj Kulashekar. Wonderful. Awar. 
devotee. Any other examples? Krishna Maharaj, we can also take the example of Parikshit Maharaj also. Okay, Maharaj Parikshit, seven days, spending his time chanting and hearing. Good? Yes? Anything else? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj, can you take the example of Valmiki Muni? He was under illusion throughout his life. And when the Narudvani came and enlightened him, then he got understood what is the purpose of life. Who is this? Valmiki? Yes, Maharaj. Who, who came and instructed him? Narudvani. Okay. And he asked him, are you, are your family going to take all your karmas which you are committing? Then uh, all the family members said no. Then he realized, you know, what is the, what mistake I am committing? Then immediately, that time all illusion has gone away. Okay. We see also Ajamila at the end of life moment, you know, just at the end of life he got himself at out of all of this maya, and he was able to get perfection because he was chanting the holy name. It gave him a second chance. Yes? Can you take Maharaj Bilamangal Thakur? Bilamangal Thakur? Yes. Uh, tell, tell more. Also, tell more about Bilva Mungo. Tell us more about Bilva Mungo. How did he take advantage? What did he do? Yes, who was that Prabhu who said Bilva Mungo? I wanted to hear more. Uh, Bilu Mangal Tagore, actually he was uh, so much attached to um, the past year, past year. Even such a very uh, high flood and so much water flowing, he was such condition so he went and see her. So afterwards, uh, she gave a very nice instructions to Bilu Mangal Tagore. Then okay. after he realized. Yes, right. Yeah, Bilu Mangal came to her on a terrible night. He took a lot of risks crossing the river and then climbing over her wall, beating on her door. So she was surprised that you took so much trouble to see me. If only you had the same desire to see Krishna. And when she said that, it entered deep into his heart and he understood Krishna. And he thought, I mean, and he, it just... It was just the word he needed and he just turned around and he left. And he went to Vrindavan and he got perfection. Okay, yes, so Bilfa Mango was there. And then, even we see, we see, for that matter, you could see Srila Prabhupada. When Srila Prabhupada met Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he was uh, arguing, you know, he, at that time Prabhupada was following Gandhi. But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati said to him, No, Krishna consciousness cannot wait for some material adjustment. The message of Lord Chaitanya is so important, it cannot wait for just some adjustment on your part. You have to take up Krishna consciousness now, you have to preach now. And so Prabhupada said that first meeting, it said that had a big impact on him. And he greatly appreciated that moment of full consciousness which he got from his buck, from his spiritual master later on. He said from that moment he accepted him as a spiritual master. Then later on they met again and he was initiated eleven years later. So we have a temple now at that place. We have that land that it's in Otadanga in Calcutta. And it's going to be a hundred years next year, in 2022, will mark the 100th anniversary of that meeting between Bhaktisiddhanta and our own Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. They met 100 years ago 
at Uta Danga, and we're opening a center there uh, in the next year in honor of the, the meeting. It's appropriate, it's the 100th anniversary. Okay? So those are some nice examples about full consciousness. So, Maharaj, yes? Uh, also, Vritrasura. Vritrasura tells Lord Indra that it is better that you kill me now. What is the use of uh, staying for so many years, having a long life without thinking of Krishna? Oh, very nice. Oh, that's a wonderful example. Yes. Vritasura, sometimes it's said he is the hero of the Bhagavatam. <laughs> he was so wonderful devotee, although he was in that demonic body, but still he was a great soul and he was so devotee. He just wanted to give up that body so he could go back to Godhead and he could be with the Lord Sankarshan, right? He was a devotee of Lord Sankarshan. So a very, very nice example. Thank you, Maharaji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, another example is, uh, is it uh, Dhruva Maharaj? Uh -huh. But just associated with Narada Muji for a short period, he got uh, um, right instructions. Yes. He was able to okay, yes. He got instructions from Narada Muni. All right, very good. So we see a lot of examples are there. Okay, and here's dealing with blasphemy, of course. Would someone like to read this? Hare Krishna. Dealing with blasphemy. There are three ways of dealing with such insults. If someone is heard blaspheming by words, one should be so expert that he can defeat the opposing party by argument. If he is unable to defeat the opposing party, then the next step is that he should not just stand there meekly, but should give up his life. The third process is followed if he is unable to execute the above mentioned two processes. And this is that one must leave the place and go away. If the devotee does not follow any of the above mentioned three processes, he falls down from his position of devotion. From devotion, nine. Further consideration of devotion. All right. So, we see in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that uh, when Lord Chaitanya was in Benares, he had two devotees there. There was Chandrasekhar and Tapana Mishra. And people were criticizing Lord Chaitanya. Well, the Mayavadi sannyasis anyway were there, and they were criticizing Lord Chaitanya as being a sentimentalist. And they were not able to convince them. They were not able to convince, and they were, and they were feeling very discouraged that the Mayavadis were criticizing Lord Chaitanya. So, of course, they should have defeated them, but it was left to Lord Chaitanya to actually establish his position. And Lord Chaitanya personally met with the Mayavadi sannyasis and delivered them and showed his actual position. So we should be able to defeat them by argument, but it's very difficult. Kali Yuga, people like to argue and they won't admit defeat. So we, tr we prefer to avoid argument and we look for people who are more interested to hear, who, want, who are more submissive and less challenging. Because people just argue, what's the benefit? We just waste our time. So better to chant Hare Krishna. So we don't waste time arguing with people, and we don't cut out their tongues, we don't get violent with them. We just go away, just leave them. We shouldn't waste our time preaching to people who are not interested to hear Krishna consciousness. If they don't have a genuine interest, then stay away from them. Of course, offending devotees. Next thing we want to understand carefully, first offense to blaspheme the devotees, Hatimata, the mad elephant offence. So offending devotees, different considerations are there. Who are you offending? Are we we're offending people? Yes, we are offending devotees, somebody who is a, a servant of Krishna. It's very serious, we want to be very careful. What is causing you to make offensive of, of offensive 
offenses are to be critical of the devotee. What is causing us to do that? That's another, what is called, it may be simply our false ego. Is it really our duty to be critical of them? Of course, to be offensive, we should, nobody should be offensive. No, well, we said to make offenses or to be critical of the devotee. What attitude must you adopt to stop this being critical? And what must you change within yourself to adopt these proper attitudes? What must, anybody like to answer some of these things? What is causing us, first of all, to make offenses or being critical of the devotees? What could it be? It could be false ego, it could be envy, anything else it could be? Hatred. Hatred, okay, yes, we may have hatred for someone, all right. Expectation from others. Yeah, maybe somebody didn't live up to our expectations, what we expected from them. Considering ourselves to be superior or the authority. Yeah, we, we're thinking we're better than them. We want to minimize their position. We want to look down on them. So what attitude must, must we adopt to stop being critical? In order to be servant. Yes, right, good. To not a piece of each in our servant of the servant. What, what do we have to change within ourselves to adopt these proper attitudes? That I'm a servant, I'm not a master. Yes, I'm a servant, I'm not the master. Anything else? Uh, making a conscious effort to glorify the devotees. Yes, that's a good thing to do. Make an effort, a conscious effort to glorify the devotees. Very nice thing to do. Try to appreciate the devotees and glorify them. Anyone who's chanted the holy name, even one time, we should consider them a devotee and we should appreciate them. Hare Krishna Maharaj, before pointing out faults in others, first we should look at ourselves that I should clear my own faults, then I should look to others. Excellent, yes, that's, that's a very important point, yes. We have to look at ourselves, and we have to understand this is our real duty, not to be critical of others, but to be critical of ourselves. And Srila Prabhupada used to tell us, he said, I see faults in others because I am honeycombed with faults myself. But he said, it's my duty as the spiritual master to find fault with disciples. But he said, don't mind, he said, I'm seeing faults in you because I am honeycombed with faults myself. So very important to be critical of ourself. It's not the duty of every devotee to find fault or to criticize others. It is the duty of the spiritual master. If someone's in the position of being the guru, then he has that duty to find fault. But other devotees, they don't have that duty. And it, may, it can create problems. You try to give critic, you, you criticize other people, then they don't like it. And they think, you're not my authority, why are you criticizing? And it's true. So we have to be very careful about finding fault or being critical of others. Look at ourselves. Don't look at others. If we're seeing faults in others, it's because the faults are there in ourself. Any more comments? Also, Maharaj, you know, in the picture what we can see, the one finger, finger point, is showing others in the three are at ours. <laughs> so, this is what uh, we have to find for Right, yes, yes, right, good. <laughs> we are seeing faults in others means it's our reflection. Yes. Mm because they're there in us. All right, good. The conclusion is, 
one should neither hate, hear nor allow vilification of a devotee of the Lord. We shouldn't hear and we shouldn't allow others to say anything bad about devotees. We don't want to hear and we don't want to encourage that. It's interesting, actually, in, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita describes an incident where it says, we, we shouldn't criticize and we shouldn't praise either. <laughs> but if, if, if you criticize someone, it's not good. And if you praise them also, it's, it can be even worse. <laughs> because you praise someone, you know, we may like it. We think, oh, he's praising me, very nice. Uh, you know, but praise is also very bad for a devotee. We don't like to be glorified. We prefer to be criticized and glorified. But it's not good for devotees to criticize other devotees. Although the devotee, a devotee may like to hear criticism of himself because it helps us to progress. It helps us, we think, actually they're right. We should think Krishna is speaking through that devotee. When they're criticizing me, Krishna is speaking through him. And I should accept that criticism. So it's interesting point to see things that way. Okay. Okay. So Sukadeva Goswami continues. Renunciation and the mechanical process of meditation for neophytes. Sukadeva Goswami describes the process of meditation on the universal form and the conception of the Virata Rup. Oh. Let me see. First of all, text number 15. Text number 15, we're hearing about preparing for death. At the last stage of life, one should be bold enough not to be afraid of death. But one must cut off all attachment to the material body and everything pertaining to it and all desires thereof. We've taken from the purport here of text number 15. One must have a chance for better desires. Otherwise, there is no chance of giving up such morbid desires. Desire is the concomitant, concomitant factor of the living entity. The living entity is eternal and therefore his desires, which are natural, for a living being are also eternal. One cannot therefore stop desiring, but the subject matter for desires must be changed. So one must develop the desire for returning back home, back to Godhead. And automatically the desires for material gain, material honour and material popularity will diminish in proportion to the development of devotional service. So we cannot stop desire, but we can change the quality of desires. So this is the point. Desire is going to be there, but we have to purify the mind and develop the higher desire. We talk about the higher taste, so we have to develop the higher desires. And the desire should be that we want to go back home, back to Godhead. Recently, I, there was somebody saying in my class, they were saying, I don't have a desire to go back to Godhead. I just, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I just want to chant and be a devotee, but I don't have the desire to go back to Godhead. So Prabhupada mentions here, we should have the desire, we should want to go back to Godhead. I remember I was in New York at one point and uh, there, was a young, uh, there was a woman there and she was not so young 
anyway, she she got some serious health health problem, and she knew she was leaving the body, so she was preparing for death, and she had been a successful book distributor as a before her health problem. She had been doing a lot of books, and she was very successful. So she met Prabhupada, and she said to Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, I just want to take birth again and come back and distribute your books. But Prabhupada said to her, he said, no, that's all right. He said, you just, you just go back to Godhead. You don't have to worry about coming back to distribute my books. You just go back to Godhead. So <laughs> and here you see also in this purport, there, there should be this desire to go back to Godhead. If you don't have that desire to go back to Godhead, then what may happen? You may <laughs> you come back again. You, there has to be some desire. So what do you desire? What do you desire? You can't say, I have no desires. It's not going to be long before another desire comes. There will be desires. So we want to develop the good desire. A good desire is to go back to Godhead. But sometimes Prabhupada would say we shouldn't be too anxious to go back to Godhead. We should just want pure devotional service. But pure devotional service is also back to Godhead. <laughs> right? Okay. Oh, could somebody read this for me, please? What about those? What about those who, for various reasons, are not able to chant? Those who are not able to chant the name as recommended above can chant the Pranava Omkara. This mechanical process for the training of the mind will lead to a realization. Go ahead. However, meditation on the limbs of the form of Vishnu is better than the impersonal Omkara meditation. All right. Yeah, we know not everybody is able to chant Hare Krishna. Sometimes, you know, we go to yoga studios, we're invited to different uh, Hatha yoga clubs or something, and we will go there and give a talk. And one time I remember I was teaching yoga myself to uh, students in a university, and I asked them to chant Hare Krishna, but the one young lady there, she was a, a Roman Catholic, and she refused to chant. She said, no, this is another religion, I'm not going to chant this, this is not my religion, I'm not going to chant, I don't... <laughs> but if, 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 so, I realized later on, I should have asked them to chant Om first, you know. <laughs> if, they, if you ask them to chant Om, they'll do it. They don't think of that as being religious. But you ask them to chant Hare Krishna, they think, oh, this is religion. But you ask them to chant Om, they'll do it. They'll sit and chant Om. <laughs> so Om is, a, as Prabhupada describes here, a mechanical process for training the mind. People sit and chant Om. And then they like meditation. So meditate on the form of Vishnu is better than chanting Om. That's a higher stage of meditation. Right? Foolish persons, bewildered by the external energy of Vishnu, do not know that the ultimate goal of the progressive search for happiness is to get in touch with Lord Vishnu, the Personality of Godhead. Right? We get these people, they, they will chant Om, But higher than Om, that we should understand what is Om. Om is the sound representation of Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna. So we want to bring them to get in touch with the personality of God. That's a real goal. We don't people we don't want people just bewildered by the the material energy. Okay, so 
I think this is a good place to stop today before we go into pantheism. Are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, you know, discussing about the Anukirtana, that time one point has been raised. That is, one is the uh, first step of various authorities you have to follow, and second one is according to one according to the level of one's realization. So, what is exactly the uh, meaning of one should uh, follow one's level of realization while doing the Anukirtana? One should follow one's level of realization while doing one's chanting. Did it? Yes. Yeah. Where, it, was in the, it was in the slide here today, was it? Mm. Or it's in the purport? Oh, here, yeah. And according to one's level of one's realization, such chanting should be anukit and constant, following in the footsteps of previous authorities and according to the level of one's realizations. In other words, we shouldn't try artificially to implant in our mind the pastimes of Lord Krishna. We should simply try to hear the holy name. We should do hearing and chanting. Don't just try to fix, you know, to, to within our mind that oh, I'm going to meditate on this pastime, I'm going to meditate on the form of Krishna and like that. We may want people sometimes prematurely, they try to jump into Raganuga Bhakti without first performing Vaidhi Bhakti they want to go into Raganuga Bhakti. And so that's a little dangerous, you can get problems. So the level of one's realization, we should have, just like uh, chanting, you may want to do it, we may want to go away into a secluded place, but we may do it for cheap adoration. We know Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he has written his uh, book, which is commented on by His Holiness Jayapataka Swami Maharaj. Tumiki Shera Vaishnava, right? What kind of Vaishnava are you? That simply for the sake of adoration and distinction, you go away into a secluded place just to chant the holy name. So we have to be, you know, we may think I'm going to be like Haridas Thakur and sit in the cave and chant, or I'm just going, you know, I'm going to do 64 rounds every day, I'm going to do 100, you know, 192 rounds a day. You get people like this, you know. We try to imitate the very, very advanced devotees. So we want to follow in the footsteps of the, of the authorities, According to our realization, we have to understand what is our actual position, what, what realization do we have? How much realization have we, have we actually realized I'm not the body, first of all? Of course, we have to follow the four principles, but it doesn't mean that we can become like Sukadeva Goswami and go around, you know, naked everywhere, just go around and sit and speak Srimad Bhagavatam. We can't imitate people like Sukadeva Goswami, we can't imitate people like Haridas Thakur, but we can appreciate their example, their example of detachment from the material world and attachment to speaking the glories of Krishna, to chanting the holy name. So according to our own realization, how much we are, you know, how much we have actually understood. We should understand what is a su suitable level for us, for us to practice it. So we have to be guided by spiritual authority. So realization, of course, what kind of realizations have we got? We've realized, have we realized Bhagavan? Have we got Bhagavan realization? 
Well, some, some sample, we know something about Bhagavan. We know something. We're devotees. We, we may not be perfectly pure devotees, but we're on the path. So we have to practice according to our understanding, how much we've been able to realize. And that realization will grow. As we practice, our level will grow. We'll realize more and more. We'll realize ourself as, as being very foolish. We'll realize how much time we've wasted in the material world and how much we've been away from Krishna consciousness. And we'll regret that. And we'll become more serious in our spiritual practice. So that kind of realization. I realize also how fortunate we are that we've come to Krishna consciousness. So this kind of realizations we want. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Wonderful. Yes? Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu? Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, we spoke about um, uh, uh, the uh, Nama Prad and uh, Nama Bhas. So, uh, we see some criticism by some non-devotees uh, uh, towards the devotees uh, saying that uh, Hare Krishna is uh, so funny, he's looking very um, with his ponytail. So, some criticism should be fine, but however, he is chanting the holy name. So, we feel that, okay, he is uh, chanted to the holy name, even though it is criticism towards us. Uh, then we find uh, the devotees who are uh, having a, a intention of uh, chanting without aprat, nama aprat. So, how do we reconcile that uh, both are? Uh, um, uh, how do we reconcile now? Because he is chanted, uh, non devotees have chanted with, uh, with without any intention, but uh, in, the, in the in the intention of criticizing, but he has taken the holy name. But we are chanting with the intention, but with Aprad. Well, of course, both are not right. <laughs> First of all, you say the non devotee, non devotee, a new person, he chanted the holy name. Right? So, he chanted the holy name, he chanted. It wasn't uh, something which he's going to commit himself to, or he hasn't committed himself to the chanting of the holy name, but he did chant the holy name. So we appreciate somebody chanted the holy name. So he began his spiritual life. Did you say he, he was critical? Uh, yeah, he is uh, chanting the holy name with, uh, with the intention of criticizing uh, the devotees. Oh, so that's... Srila Prabhupada didn't mind that kind of chanting. Somebody he said if they, if they say the holy name, he said it's good. And just like newspapers, they would print newspaper articles sometimes and they would criticize Hare Krishna movement. But Prabhupada said, oh, they're saying Hare Krishna so many times. He said, everybody who reads the article, they'll read Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, so many times. So he said, very good. <laughs> so Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati would just count how many times Hare Krishna was there in the article. He didn't care what they said, just so long as the holy name was there. Let them hear the holy name. And if somebody chants the holy name, it's even better. In the times of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was in Benares, the Mayavari sannyasis couldn't chant the holy name. And it wasn't until Lord Chaitanya spent time with them and preached to them, and then finally he was able to get them to chant the holy name. And when they did chant the holy name, then Lord Chaitanya took prasadam with them. He accepted their association because he understood, now they've chanted the holy name, now they're Vaishnavas. <laughs> so, Somebody chants the holy name, he's a Vaishnava. And some, some, you say somebody else is chanting the holy name, a devotee, but offensive? Yes, yes, Maharaj. What's he doing? 
So if if uh, if he is chanting with uh, offense also, I mean, if he is chanting, but with offense, with the non, uh, with uh, uh, what do you say, uh, not very uh, uh, clear in his chanting, but still it becomes offensive for him. Well, yes, of course, you know, it, it's, as we say, we're, we're, we're becoming pure devotees. We're not yet pure devotees. We have to appreciate that he's trying to chant the holy name. And what, what he does need is good association. He needs to get good association from a senior Vaishnava who can instruct him in the proper behavior because the proper behavior will help to free him from these offense, from the offenses which he may be committing. So that's the important thing, that one has to be properly guided, the right association, to free him from offenses. So, but because he's trying to chant the holy name, although he's making offenses, the, the senior devotees have to come and the pure devotee or the guru, and he has to give instruction to him and properly guide him how to behave properly and what is the proper things to do, what to do, what not to do. Just like we see here in this chapter, Sukadeva Goswami is describing to Maharaj Parikshit, don't be a grihamedi, avoid that, do this, become a grihasta, chant the holy name. He's telling him what, to, what not to do, what to do. So, this is, this is spiritual practice. Do this, don't do that. So, we have to learn, we have to be trained. Education. Everybody needs education. Education is an ongoing thing. You're never too old to learn. We have a common saying like that, eh? never too old to learn. We, we should never think, I know everything. We always be willing to hear more and to learn. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Can I also ask one question? Yes, please. Uh, Maharaj, this is regarding the discussion of uh, developing the right desire. I mean, it was my, it, we heard that uh, we should also develop desire to go back to Godhead. Sometimes we also hear that. Uh, uh, devotees should not uh, desire to go back to God. They should desire only to please Krishna. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also said, Mama Janmani Janmani Shari. And in Damodarashtakam prayers also it is said, I do not desire anything, any kind of liberation. Lord Shiva also while glorifying uh, uh, Chitraketu Maharaj that the devotee do not mind going to heaven or hell. So, how, how to understand and balance Maharaj? Yes, well, We have to understand that there is such a thing as back to Godhead, that there is a spiritual world. The Lord is there and his pastimes are going on eternally. At the same time, a devotee is surrendered to the will of the Lord, whatever is the Lord's desire. I would think that that is the balance, really. We don't, it's not that we go back to Godhead, but it, does, does, does the Lord want us to go back to Godhead? Does He want to take us? Is He going to take us there? Are we going to get be admitted? We just want devotional service. Of course, that's what we want. But if, if we get the opportunity to go back to Godhead, certainly we should accept it. The Lord arranges for people to go back to Godhead and if, if He gives a devotee the chance, Jiva Goswami says we don't immediately go back to Godhead, but we go wherever the Lord is performing His pastimes in the material world. And we take further training there in the association of the Lord and taking part in the pastimes of the Lord. And that gives us more opportunity to prepare ourselves to go back to Godhead. But as you say, Lord Chaitanya said, birth after birth, I simply want devotional service. But devotional service is back to Godhead. For a pure devotee, this is the spiritual world. He sees Krishna everywhere. 
Prabhupada was in New York, but he said, I'm always in Vrindavan. He's not in New York, he, although he was sitting in New York, but he said, I'm always thinking of Vrindavan. So if we're always thinking of Krishna, if we're fully Krishna conscious, then that is the spiritual world. You're already back to Godhead. Thank you, thank you so much, Maharaj. Totally a different vision that we are one devotee is always in the spiritual. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. All right, so we'll meet tomorrow and we'll continue with this first chapter. So thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you, Manas, for accepting our invitation. And we are really grateful, in spite of your busy schedule, you have accepted to come and uh, give your association and help us to learn. Thank you, Manas. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Go back to Vrindaki Jai.